riotous and the, U and the policeman can pull me over without a warrant and arrest me. But let's get to the matter in hand. Anthony T. Browder is a native of Chicago and a graduate of Howard University's College of Fine Arts. He's an author, cultural historian, artist, and educational consultant. He has lectured throughout the United States, Mexico, Africa, Japan, and Europe, and has appeared on and conducted numerous television, radio, and print interviews. Mr. Browder is the founder and director of the Institute of Karmic Guidance, a culturally oriented organization which is dedicated to the dissemination of ancient Egyptian history and metaphysics. <coughs> Through the Institute, Mr. Browder sponsors lectures and seminars and conducts African-centric tours of Washington, D.C. He also organizes study groups throughout the United States and abroad and personally escorts annual study tours to Egypt and West Africa. He is the author and publisher of three major works, From the Browder File, 22 Essays on the African American Experience, Nile Valley Civilization, Contributions to Civilization, and My First Trip to Africa. Incidentally, My First Trip to Africa was co-authored by Mr. Browder's 10-year-old daughter, Atlantis Ty. This book chronicles the experience of Atlantis during a 13-day study tour to Egypt in November of 1989. All of these works are currently being used as textbooks in classrooms throughout the country, including the New York City school system, the largest in the world. Tony describes himself as a chronicler of facts and information relative to the positive portrayal of the worldwide African experience. So let's put our hands together and give a warm welcome to Mr. Anthony T. Brown. Hotel. Hotel. All right, I'm pleased to be here this evening. I see that uh, Brother Chris and, and all of those who are working with him have done their work over the past year to organize you, to bring you together, to give you information that will allow you to begin the process of freeing your mind and taking control of your communities, and raising the consciousness of those who will come behind you. That is what this whole project is all about. There are those who have the same color skin as we do, who can't understand what this African stuff is all about. Question why you want to spend your Tuesday evening going to hear somebody lecture about Africa? Or why are you interested in, in talking about traveling to Africa? Or wearing African clothes or taking African name? See, in reality, they don't understand who they are. They don't understand what has happened to us. And that's part of a very carefully calculated plan, which has been in effect for us personally over 400 years, to deny us some sense of cultural identity, some sense of historical identity. Dr. Carter G. Woodson referred to it in his landmark publication as The Miseducation of the Negro. And he said, quite correctly, when you control a person's thinking, you don't have to worry about their actions. You don't have to tell them to stand here or go there for they will find their proper place and will stay in it. And such a person does not have to be ordered to the back door of any given society for they will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, the very nature will demand one, the miseducation makes it necessary. So one of the things that we've got to do, sisters and brothers, is to, is to shove off this, this Negro mentality and begin to understand who we are. One of the first things that a name should do is to orient a people to a landmass, to a history, to a culture, to a language, to a philosophy, to a concept of God. And if the name that you call yourself as a people doesn't do that, the name needs to be flushed down the toilet because it's worthless. So who are colored people? Who are Negroes? Who are you? And more importantly, who are you not? See, because we have allowed others, we have allowed those who have been responsible for 
enslaving our ancestors to also their descendants who've been responsible for educating us. And you cannot expect the same people responsible for enslaving you to give you the tools necessary to free your minds. It won't happen. Free people free themselves by understanding who they are, by holding their ancestors high and looking to them for guidance and direction. Free people never allow other people to tell their history or their story for them. They see their history as being sacred because they understand what it takes in order for women to be women and men to be men and for people to create a family. That's what this whole process is all about. Hopefully that's what you all are getting out of this, this, this studying experience. You're having an opportunity now, some of you for the first times in your life, to be introduced to information that you should have gotten from the time that you were children. But because of the fact that there has a, been a system in place that was designed specifically to deny you knowledge yourself, because if you know and understand who you are, and your historical and cultural legacy, then you will never allow anyone, anyone, to just come into your community and open up a <coughs> store and freely give your money to them. You will never allow yourself to worship a God that doesn't look like you. Right. Understand how important this, this, this reality is. It is because of the fact that we've been miseducated that I have embarked upon what I see and what I have accepted is, is, is my mission to do what I can to help to educate our people. It was through the writing of uh, my first book, From the Browder File, that I was instrumental in opening the doors. <coughs> but it's through my, my second work, Now Valley Contributions to Civilization, that I have attempted to establish a framework for understanding the importance of identifying with the past so that you can begin to bring this information to this particular point in time in history to be able to control your actions so that you can create the correct future for your children. See, because that's what this whole thing is all about. See, we aren't living this life just for ourselves, just to see, you know, what, what kind of car we can buy or how many nice clothes we can buy. We can't take any of that stuff with us when we die. We're living this life in order to pave the way for those who will come behind us. If we don't understand that, if we don't create institutions, if we don't see to it that certain information is instilled within the educational system for our children, then they're going to have to come back and do the work that we should have done. That's where we find ourselves at this particular point in time in history, trying to, again, see to it that our people are properly educated. The whole purpose of my current publication, Now Valley Contributions to Civilization, is to deal with this whole issue of who we are and why it's important that we study our history and our culture. It's important for us to understand that, it's important for us to understand why <clears throat> there are those who want to deny us our rich African history. It's important to understand why there are, why there are those who will say, well, the Egyptians weren't African. <laughs> the Egyptians were, were uh, a multicultural people. You know, and we need to understand why these lies exist. These lies exist because whoever holds the, the, the accomplishments of ancient Kemet to their bosom stands at the head of the human family. So it's important to understand why educational institutions fabricated lies, scholarly lies, in order to write African people out of their own history, in order to justify the, the enslavement of African people. Let me give you some, some, some idea of what I'm talking about in terms of how Europeans found it necessary to fabricate lies about so-called Negroes. If you look at the 1884 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, that publication said, <coughs> in describing the Negro, let me give you this exact quote, in describing the so-called Negro, they said that the Negro occupies the lowest position on the evolutionary scale, thus affording the best material for the comparative study of the highest anthropoids and the human species. In other words, if you want to study apes, study niggas, because they are more closely related to apes than any other people on the planet. Now, this was passed off as legitimate scholarship. They also went on to say, in order to describe why Negroes are so 
so slow and so backwards. They also went on to say that the cranial sutures close much earlier in the Negro than in the other races. To this, again, this is a direct quote now. To this premature ossification of the skull, preventing all further development of the brain, many pathologists have attributed the inherent mental inferiority of the blacks, an inferiority which is even more marked than their physical differences. In other words, what their scientists, what their scholars said was that by studying the, the skull of Negroes, that the cranial sutures of the skull of the Negroes began to shut down at the onset of puberty, at around the age of 13. The skull begins to fuse shut, so that by the time the Negro has reached the age of 19, the skull is fused together, and their brain is no longer capable of processing any additional information. So if you ever learn all there is to learn, to know by the age of, eight, by the age of 19, that's it for you if you happen to be colored. Now these are the lies <coughs> that were passed off as the truth. These are the lies that unfortunately <coughs> my great-grandparents, my grandparents, and my parents <coughs> had to endure as children living in this society. You shouldn't try to achieve anything of any worth because, you know, Negroes aren't capable of doing that. When in reality, when you begin to understand the extent to which you have been lied to and begin to pull off the covers and find pieces of the truth, you begin to realize why they had to lie. Because their entire foundation, the entire foundation of the United States of America and most nations of Europe was built on the backs of the creation of African people. <clears throat> My primary area of focus is the Nile Valley civilization or ancient Kemet, uh, primarily because I have spent a number of years traveling there and also because of the fact that it is there where you can find the oldest documented information about the first civilization on the face of this planet. And it's, uh, it's important that we understand that this was the first documented civilization on the face of this planet. And it's also important that we understand that this was a civilization that was created by African people before there was a Europe. Before there was a Europe. This is important. We understand by studying the text that the first calendar ever created by human beings was created in the Nile Valley over 6,000 years ago. It has been described as the most accurate calendar ever created by humans on this planet. The first calendar of 365 and a quarter days. The Africans were responsible then for studying the heavens they understood that it took the Earth 365 and a quarter days to make a complete orbit around the sun. They knew then that at that particular point in time in history that the world was round, something that Christopher Columbus didn't discover until 500 years ago. It's important to be able to put things into some sort of timeline so that you can understand who we were before there were Europeans. The first building in stone still stands today in Africa. And I'm not talking about some little hut. Right? Because most of us, when we think of African people, we think of black folk running around in the jungle, butt naked with a bone in their nose, cooking white people in the pot. Because these are the images that we grew up on on, on television. But how many of you all have ever dealt with the reality that Africans were responsible for creating the very first man-made structure of stone in the history of humanity? A building that stands 194 stories, 194 feet tall, 19 stories. A building that is still standing today. So how do you, how do you deal with this history, then also begin to deal with the lies that have been told about us in order to justify our enslavement? When you begin to understand this dilemma, then you can begin to, to understand the mindsets of, of the Europeans who had to fabricate a history for us who had to say that we were Negroes. The Portuguese were the ones responsible for introducing this term <coughs> to humanity. Kidnapped a dozen African men in the 15th century, brought them back to Portugal, presented them as a gift to the Pope who sanctioned the further enslavement of African people. The Portuguese then called these people Negroes, said that they were soulless savages. And as a result of the fact that they, according to them, had no concept of God or didn't have the capacity for a concept of God, it was our right to enslave these people because once they were enslaved by good Christian people, they might get to know God and go to heaven. When in fact, in fact, 
the very first documented concept of God, heaven and hell, judgment, was recorded in Africa over 6,000 years ago. So I'm telling you there's information that we have at our fingertips, that we have at our fingertips. We just have got to begin to develop an interest in acquiring for ourselves. It's important for us to understand the other lies that have been told. You know, supposedly you go to school and you're told that Hippocrates is the father of medicine, a Greek is the father of medicine, when if you know a little bit, just a little bit about African history, all you have to do is to look at the Hippocratic Oath in order to shatter that myth. The first line of the Hippocratic Oath says, I swear by the God Apollo and the God of medicine, Asclepius. <coughs> if you understand anything at all about Greek history, the word Asclepius is the Greek name for Imhotep. So who is Imhotep? The first physician in the recorded history of humanity. Imhotep is supposedly the author of the, the oldest medical treatise ever written. It was believed to have been written somewhere around 3100 BCE. It is now called the Edwin Smith Medical Papyrus, named after the European Edwin who discovered it. But in this document, it describes 48 different treatments for injuries to the head, to the face, to the neck, and to the thorax. It contained over 90 anatomical terms. We're talking about a point in time 1900 years before Hippocrates was born. Again, if you study the medical texts that were written by African people, you'll find that as late as 1400 BCE, Africans had already devised contraceptives. They had devised a means of birth control. They had already created a test to determine if a woman was pregnant and the sex of the unborn child. It was a very simple procedure. What they would do is to have the woman who suspected that she was pregnant urinate in a bowl, and then they would take a bag of wheat and a bag of barley and place them in the bowl and wait a few days. And if any one of the bags sprouted, if the bag of wheat began to sprout, it meant that the woman was pregnant and that she was going to have a female child. If the bag of barley sprouted, it meant that she was pregnant and was going to have a male child. And if both bags sprouted, I assumed she was going to have twins, one of each. <laughs> but it's important to put this African scientific discovery into some sort of historical context. See, because the Europeans did not discover the urine pregnancy test until 1926. And they did not create a test to determine the sex of an unborn child until 1933. So what we're talking about, sisters and brothers, is the reality that there was a wealth of scientific, philosophical, spiritual, academic knowledge that was developed by Africans in the Nile Valley thousands of years ago that has been covered up and later claimed by Europeans in order for them to stand at the head of the human family and say that we are the greatest thing that God ever created. These are the lies that have been placed in your way to prevent you from discovering the truth, to prevent you from discovering who you are. It's important for us to realize that there were some people over the years who traveled to Africa and who did the work, did the research, and attempted to share this information with the rest of the world. It's important to understand that, that not all Europeans attempted to, <coughs> to participate in this great lie. There was a book written by a Frenchman by the name of Constantine de Volney in the late 1700s. Volney was a man who had traveled to uh, various parts of Africa, Asia, and described his study. And his book became an instant bestseller in France. There were some gentlemen in England who had read the book and decided to publish an English edition of the book. It became a bestseller in England. So they decided to make some money and to make an American edition of this book and sell it over here in the States. This is around the early 1800s when they decided to uh, create an American edition of this book, Ruins of Empire. But because of the fact that Africans were still being enslaved in America at that time, the European publisher did not want to offend their white cousins. 
And so they decided to omit pages 13, 14, and 15 from this book. And let me just give you one, one paragraph that they omitted from this book. It was a statement made by Varney that <coughs> describing the people of Africa, the people of Egypt, it was a statement that said that there in Egypt are people now forgotten who discovered while others were yet barbarians the elements of the arts and sciences, a race of men who are now ejected from society because of their sable skin and frizzy hair founded on the study of the laws of nature, those civil and religious systems which still govern the universe. Now, what does that mean? Barney said that there in Africa are a people who are now forgotten, who discovered while Europeans were still barbarians, they discovered the elements of the arts and sciences and those civil and religious systems which still govern the universe. When Barney discovered that this text had been these pages had been omitted from the American edition. He forbade them to print any more copies until they corrected that error. So we need to again understand what has been happening to African people in their history and their culture over the years. We need to also understand that <coughs> Europeans at one point in time in the history of Africa were so captivated by the accomplishments of the ancient Africans that they even believed that if they ate the bodies of these deceased Africans, then their substance would empower them to greatness. During the time, yes indeed, it runs in the family. <laughs> Consider this. Consider this reality. There was a white market that was created for mummies bodies of Africans. And by the 12th century, the ground up remains of Africans were being used as cures for epilepsy, being used for cures for headaches. People believed that if they digested the bodies of ancient Africans, that it would prevent them from aging. Renaissance artists would ground up the, uh, the, 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 the bodies of, of these mummies into their paints with the hope that this would make their paints brilliant for hundreds of years. In 1585, from 1585 to 1586, one European man, one Englishman, exported to England over 600 pounds of mummified flesh. And as late as 1978, Mummies, ground up mummies, were still being sold at a pharmacy in New York City for $40 an ounce. Okay? We need to understand something about what has happened to us and why roadblocks are placed in your way to prevent you from discovering the horrible truth about what has happened to us as a people. So what I'd like to do at this juncture going back, shifting gears, and going back to my, my artistic mode, is to share with you some images <coughs> that will reinforce some of the more cogent aspects of our history and our, co and, our, and, our, and our story. I'm a firm believer, as the brother said before me, as the brother Bruce said before me, that a picture is worth a thousand words. And that the pictures that I want to share with you are images that will help to reinforce within your mind something about the historical reality of African people and hopefully help you to begin to understand what it is you must do in order to reclaim your African mind, in order to become a born again African and resurrect your African consciousness and understand who you are, begin to move in the right direction for the sake of your children. So what I'm going to share with you is a 6,000 year overview of African history, African culture, African spirituality, to show you the impact that this legacy had on the world and how Europeans freely borrowed and stole from this historical legacy and used it to empower themselves at their own expense. Do you realize Europeans have a desire to be more Africans than y'all do? Because they realize, they realize that their very existence is dependent upon the things that your ancestors created. So as long as they can continue to tap into 
your ancestral legacy while keeping you detached from it, then it means that they will never have any problems about going wherever they want to to take those things that you don't even care about. These are important issues, sisters and brothers. It's vitally important that you understand where we find ourselves today so that you can begin to prepare yourself for the struggles that will come tomorrow. And you better believe that they are coming. So if we can, have the light, please. And uh, sister, if you can, turn on the slide projector for me. I just want to begin with this slide for a quick second to deal with this whole issue of, of black history. This was a, an ad that was produced uh, a number of years ago by Eastern Airlines, an ad that you all would only find during the month of February, during so-called Black History Month. And it said before there was American history, there was black history, and that black history is portrayed as ancient Kemetic or ancient Egyptian history. Now that is a fact. The only problem with this is that it seems as though the only time that you all should be studying and talking about your history is during February, which is the shortest month of the year and the coldest month of the year that has been set aside to study the history of the oldest people on the planet. And then the other problem with that is, is that you'll only see ads commemorating our history in so-called African-centered publications, Jet, Essence, Ebony, you'll never see an ad such as this in Time, in Life, or in Newsweek. It is as if we are the only ones who are supposed to know this story. And the only time that we're supposed to deal with this issue is during the month of February. And after February, we go back to 11 months of lack of history month. So you need to realize that every day, every month, is a time that should be set aside for you all to know who you are, to study your history and your culture. We can have the next slide, sister. Next slide, please. Just push the button on the side. No, the button on the side, you have two small buttons on the side. There you go, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> this is a photograph of the Step Pyramid of Saqqara, the oldest man-made structure of stone. 197 feet tall, a 19-story skyscraper built by Africans over 5,000 years ago. Do you understand the technology that went into designing this and constructing this? You realize that when you see this structure, you have to throw out all of those negative stereotypes about Africans as being nothing but savages. They were the first architects, first engineers, the history of humanity. Next slide. It's important for you to also associate images of people who are responsible for these historical accomplishments. This is the King Zoser, the man that commissioned Imhotep to design that step pyramid. During his time frame, Zoser was the most powerful ruler on the face of this planet, the wealthiest man on earth, commanded the mightiest army on the face of this planet. Look at this. This is a brother, even though his nose is missing, you can still tell it's a brother. <laughs> and we're gonna talk a little bit about, a little bit later on about missing noses and hair. That's not an accident. Next slide, please. Short distance away from uh, Saqqara, where the Step Pyramid is located, we have the Giza Plateau. Giza is significant because of these three structures that you see before you, these three pyramids. More research has been done, more books have been written, more archaeological digs have been done at this site because of these structures than any other site on the face of this planet. It's important for you all to understand that the uh, Great Pyramid in the background of this structure right here, the Great Pyramid of Khufu, was a structure, again, built over 4,000 years ago, which held the record as being the tallest man-made structure on Earth until as late as 108 years ago. For 
So for over 4,000 years, this was the tallest building on earth. It stands approximately 450 feet high, as tall as a 45-story skyscraper, covers an area of 13, 13 acres. It is three and a half blocks wide by three and a half blocks wide by three and a half blocks wide by three and a half blocks wide. This one building is made up of over two and one half million stone blocks, which weigh an average of two and a half tons each. There's enough stone in this one building to make 30 Empire State buildings. And it's important for you all to realize now, you got to debunk these myths now when folks start lying, trying to rewrite history and talking about their ancestors built the pyramids when they were enslaved in Egypt. That's a lie because the pyramid was built at least a thousand years before the first Jew Abraham was born. So what you're looking at, sisters and brothers, is an indication of the technological accomplishments that were created by African people, architects, scientists, engineers, designers, construction persons, thousands of years ago. This is an aspect of your story that you all have never been exposed to. Next slide. Now, what is this statue? <coughs> What's the name of it? Horomachus. Got here two different names. I hear some people call it Horomachus, some other folks are calling it the Sphinx. All right? You need to be aware of two realities, all right? Both of you all are right, but one is more correct than the other. The word Sphinx is a Greek word. This statue was created over 5,000 years before there was a Greek. So what did the Africans call it? Hermachus. What does that mean? It is a statue which has been regarded by a small group, small number of Egyptologists. This has been regarded as the oldest sculpture ever created by human beings. If you talk to Egyptologists off the record, they will tell you <coughs> that this statue was built somewhere between 7,000 and 10,000 years ago. They don't know how old it is. They're afraid to say how old it is. It is a statue that has the head of a man and the body of a lion. It is a statue that is symbolic, that represents the African way of symbolically relating to their environment. Because of course they knew lions don't have human heads. So you can't just, I mean, you gotta look at it from an African perspective, it is symbolic. What does it represent? What does the symbolism mean? The head is the head of the son of God, Heru, the son of God. The head represents an individual who has obtained divine intelligence. The body of a lion symbolizes the animal nature that exists within all human beings. Now you are a aware of your animal nature. You invite somebody over to your house for dinner and they got poor table manners, you say they eat like a pig. <laughs> you know, if a brother treats a sister in a bad way, sister might accuse the brother of dogging her out. You know, you know, we sometimes act like animals. So what is the lion? The lion is regarded as the king of the beast, the king of this animal nature. But if you look at this statue, 240 feet long, 66 feet high, you see that this lion is sitting down very calmly, it's cool, it's collected. What it means is that when one is able to refine their intellect through knowledge of self, you can master your lower animal nature. You no longer behave like a beast. So it becomes, this statue then becomes a symbol for human perfectibility. Through knowledge of self, you can master your lower animal nature. This is Hail Maket. Heru, it means Heru on the horizon. Heru is the son of God. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Next slide, please, sister. Here is the face of Hail Maket. This face is 13 feet, 8 inches wide. The face of the son of God, and even though the face of the son of God is missing his nose and lips, you all can still tell who his father was, can't you? <laughs> you also need to be aware of the fact that it is no coincidence that his nose and lips are missing. If you study history, 
European history, you will find that when the Frenchman Napoleon Bonaparte came to Egypt in 1798 in the first leg of his journey to conquer the world, he came to Egypt because he knew that Egypt <coughs> held the secrets of life and that if he could obtain some of these secrets, they would help him in his quest to conquer the rest of the world. So then imagine Napoleon's surprise when he came upon this statue of Hermacket, which was at that time literally buried up to his neck in sand. And he saw this 13 foot, eight inch wide <coughs> head of an African staring down upon him, which meant that Napoleon had to come face to face with his deepest fear. And that is the civilization that I've held in such high esteem for all of these years was an African civilization. And Napoleon, being too weak to accept the historical reality that he saw confronting him, instructed his soldiers to take their cannons and shoot the nose and the lips off of this statue. It is Napoleon who is responsible for giving us the statement that history is a lie agreed upon. And I submit to you all this evening, sisters and brothers, that when it comes to telling the history or the story of African people, the general consensus has been to lie. To say that you ain't nothing but niggas. You ain't got no history, you ain't got no culture. When if you begin to study for yourself, you will find that the converse is true. Next slide. Now, let me share with you some interesting discoveries, all right? <clears throat> These are two photographs of the beard of Haramaki, right? The image on the right here is the actual portion of the actual beard of Haramaki, one thirtieth of the actual length of the beard of Haramaki. This image is now on display in the British Museum in London. It's on display. What they don't have on display are the shattered pieces of the nose and lips of Haramaki, which are in the basement, not on the but they display the beard. And you can see here the beard was originally broken into two pieces and it was glued back together again. Now the beard on the left is a copy that now stands in the lobby of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. The Europeans have the original and the Africans have the copy. All right? Now I want you to take note of the fact that this is a copy. See here, it is not broken in two pieces. One solid piece. Make a mental note of this slide because I'm going to refer to it a little bit later on. All right? Next slide, please. Now, this is a sphinx. This is a Greek sphinx. If you, when you leave this lecture this evening, and go home, pull out your dictionary, and look up the definition of sphinx, and you'll find that the word sphinx means to strangle or to hold. That's what this statue means. That's what this statue represents. The story of the sphinx, the Greek sphinx, comes out of the story of, of Oedipus Rex and the riddle of the sphinx. The story of Oedipus Rex was based upon this sphinx. There was a monster that had the head of a woman, the head and breast of a woman, and the body of a lion. And this beast was perched on a cliff which was um, right outside of, uh, alongside of the road, which led to the city of Thebes in Greece. And this sphinx here, this monster, would ask a question or a riddle to every person who happened to wander down that road. And that riddle was, the riddle was in essence a metaphor for the human experience, okay? The riddle was what walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three legs in the evening. And the more legs that it walks on, the weaker <coughs> it becomes, and whoever could not answer that riddle was strangled by the Sphinx. Now it's important to understand why the Sphinx is a woman. Because in the Greek tradition, women are inherently evil. In the Greek tradition, men are divinely intelligent. And as a result of this divinity, as a result of this masculine divinity, the greatest love that a man could ever experience is a love with another man. The Greeks were responsible for legitimizing the concept of homosexuality. They didn't want to have nothing to do with women. So then they portrayed women as monsters, as beasts, as wild animals. So think about this. Again, whoever could not answer the riddle was strangled by this monster. The only person who successfully answered this riddle was a man by the name of Oedipus. 
He realized that the, that the riddle was a metaphor for the human experience and, and understood that the answer was man. Because man walked on four legs in the morning of his life as a child, two legs in the afternoon of his life as an adult, and three legs in the evening of his life when he walks with the cane as an elder. All right? So after having given the correct answer to this riddle, the Sphinx then commits suicide by jumping off of a cliff. Oedipus then goes into the city of Thebes where he proceeds to murder his father, marries, and then has sex with his mama. This is where Freud came up with this concept of the Oedipus complex, this notion that every man wants to have sex with his mama. That's European garbage. That's their mentality. And you have to understand that and identify it as such. To the Africans, this statue represented Hermaphrodite. To the Greeks, it was a monster. And if you look at the tail right here, of the statue, you'll see that the tail is in the head of a serpent. So the Greeks then were responsible for introducing the concept of women being seduced by the serpent, women being evil and serpents being evil. <laughs> understand who gave you the beliefs that you all have accepted as reality. And understand how damaging these beliefs are to your psyche. Next slide, please. This, sisters and brothers, this is a star. This is the father of Heru. The face on the statue of Hermachus is the face of his son. I told you Hermachus was the son Heru, was the son of God, this is his father. The story of Asar is the first story in the recorded history of humanity of a God who was symbolically crucified and after his death, his spirit came and impregnated his wife, Aset, who was still a virgin. The first story of Immaculate Conception. And then nine months later, Aset gave birth to their son, Heru, who was born to avenge the murder of his father. It's important for you all to realize that Heru was born on December the 25th, which was the same birthday as his father. It's also important for you all to understand that this story was written in Africa for thousand years before the birth of Jesus the Christ? Next slide. Here is one of thousands of images of Asar's wife, Aset, nursing her son, Heru. This is the virgin mother. This is the prototype of the virgin mother, the black Madonna. If you were to travel to Kemet, we've been taking study groups to uh, study tours to Egypt for the last eight years. If you were to come to Kemet, I can show you images carved on temples, temples that are over 3,000 years old, that show you the Annunciation, where the angel of God comes to a set and says that you're going to be impregnated by the spirit of your husband, where she is immaculately impregnated by her husband. And you can see, see images carved on the temple where she sits on the uh, birthing stool and gives birth to her son. And then in the next panel, you see her son being nursed by the mother and three kings from the east come to adorn him and give him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Carved on these African temples now, 3,000 years old, 4,000 years old. It's also important to understand that when the Europeans came into Africa, they worshiped these African gods. It was only after they left Africa that they took these guys back to their homeland, but presented them as European. <coughs> All right. Next slide shows you the Europeanized version of a set in Heru. And this is Isis and Horus. All right. We know Asar by his Greek name Osiris. We know uh, a set by her Greek name Isis. We know Heru by his Greek name Horus. So Isis and Horus becomes the Greek Madonna and Child. After Greece was conquered by the Romans, the Romans then took these Africanized gods, 
took them to Rome, and then further Europeanized them. So Isis and Horus becomes, in the next slide, they become, next slide, the next slide, they become the Madonna and Child. And all throughout Europe, prior to the Europeanization of Aset and Heru, they built temples in honor of the black Madonna and Child. Pope John Paul II from Poland, notice whenever he goes to Poland, he goes to the shrine of the black Madonna in Czechoslovakia and kisses the feet of the black Madonna and Child. The Pope, Pope John Paul II, to this day, worships the black Madonna. Next slide. Now, in terms of dealing with this concept of Africans as being soulless savages, having no concept of God, let's take this whole story of Asar, Aset, and Heru and look at it from a broader perspective. Asar, after his murder, impregnated his spirit, impregnated his wife. His wife later gave birth to a son, Heru. And then after Heru ruled as Lord of the Earth, Asar was resurrected and became the Lord of Judgment. Was called literally the Lord of Judgment and took his position on the throne of judgment here. And Asar's role was to determine whether or not the souls of the dear departed who came before him would go to heaven or to hell. The oldest concepts now of judgment and heaven and hell were written by Africans over 6,000 years ago, 4,000 years before the birth of Jesus the Christ. And the process was that the soul, and this is from, this is a scene that's called the weighing of the soul, very popular scene that you can find in many tombs over in uh, Kemen in the West Bank. Here we see the image of the man who stands before a star to have his way sold. The man of the, the, the soul of this deceased man is dressed in white because for thousands of years before the world was turned upside down, white was the color associated with death. White represented the absence of the life principle. All right? And you all know that. <laughs> Even though you've been brainwashed, you all know that. Think about that, um, think about that uh, next month. On Mother's Day, when you go to church, <laughs> if your mother is alive, you wear a red carnation. And if she's deceased, you wear a white carnation because white is the color associated with death. It represents the absence of life. So, so here we see the soul of this man dressed in white standing before two images of Ma'at. Ma'at is the nature or the, the goddess who represents the principles of truth, justice, righteousness, Balanced harmony and reciprocity. <coughs> Ma'at has a symbol that is associated with her, and that is the feather, the ostrich feather, which represents the same principles of Ma'at. And here we see this man holding in his hand, clutching to his chest, the feather of Ma'at. Now, in Kemet, Ma'at, the rules of Ma'at were the law of the land, and there were 42 admonitions of Ma'at, or 42 declarations of innocence, where the soul of each person had to stand before God Almighty, Asar, and recite the 42 admonitions of Ma'at. Some of these 42 admonitions were, I have not lied. I have not committed adultery. I have not stolen. I have not cursed God. I have not polluted myself. I have not polluted the land. All right? And in this next scene, we see here the scale of Ma'at, the scale that represents the principles of truth and justice. So on one side of the balance, we see the feather of Ma'at. On the other side of the balance, we see a symbol which represents the heart of this deceased man. Because in the African tradition, it was believed that the heart was the seat of the soul. Hence, the title of the scene, the weighing of the soul of the deceased. And as his heart is weighed on the scale, on the balance against the feather of Ma'at, he recites the 42 declarations of innocence. And if he is truthful, if he has lived within the laws of Ma'at, it means then that his heart will be as light as a feather. That's where the concept comes from. And then the reading is recorded in the Book of Judgment by Jehudi, the husband of Ma'at. 
And all of this takes place before Osar, who is seated on the throne of judgment, and makes the final determination as to whether or not the soul of this person, the soul of every person who comes before him, goes to heaven or hell. Powerful concepts and ideas, which were sprang from the minds of African people thousands of years ago. Knowledge and information which has been distorted, but still affects the world today. How does it affect it? Next slide, let me show you. This is another image of my eye. Again, you see the ostrich feather in the hair. You see the hands, outstretched hands with the wings. I want you all to study. I'm going to pretend like I'm a psychiatrist for a second now. And I want, I want to get into your subconscious mind. And I want you all to, to look at this image. And I want you to tell me, as your psychiatrist now, I want you to tell me, does this image trigger any thoughts in your mind? Does it remind you of any images that you may have seen? Eagle? Cross? Native American? Native American? Phoenix? How about this? Next slide. How about this image? The angel? idea for the angel comes from the image of my now this is a 15th century painting of the archangel Michael bless his soul <laughs> and here you see Michael holding in his hand the scale of my eye. check this out the scale of my eye. on one side of the balance is the soul that he is weighing on the other side of the balance you see the forces of evil evil tugging you on the scale for this image for his soul this is an African concept Understand where it came from. Understand who this really is, what this really represents. This is your history. This is your spirituality. Next slide. Um, this is just something I threw in. Uh, <laughs> this is an inter interesting uh, uh, object. It was. It used to be. It used to be on exhibit <coughs> right in the entrance to the Cairo Museum. Uh, and it was called, up until 1969, it was called the Bird of Saqqara. It was found in Saqqara, in Egypt, where the Step Pyramid was built uh, around the turn of, in the late 1800s. And because of the fact that it looked like a bird, they called it the Bird of Saqqara. But it wasn't until 1969 when an aeronautical engineer saw this and, and thought it looked very much like an airplane. Two aeronautical engineers from the United States from the Goddard Space Flight Center, which is located right outside of Washington, D.C., also saw this and were intrigued. Thought it reminded them of, of, a, of an airplane that they had seen in the States. They received permission from the Egyptian government to take the measurements of this bird of Saqqara. They came back to Washington. They made a scale model of this bird. They put it in the wind tunnel, and they found that it had the capacity to fly. And so they have since renamed this object the Glider of Saqqara. Africans dealing with aerodynamics, all right. all right? Before the Wright brothers. That means the Wright brothers were wrong, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> yeah, C-140, yes, exactly. Exactly. Now, I'm sure all of you all grew up reading stories or watching movies on television about the uh, the Europeans, the knights, and the castles, and, and, and all of those fantastic stories. Now, how many of you all realize this is a castle, correct? Guess where this castle was built? It was built in Nubia, 1500 BCE, before Europe. Africans had castles, drawbridges, moats, the full nine yards. A city within a city, designed by Africans thousands of years ago that most of y'all don't know nothing about. Next slide. And the reason why you all don't know about this <laughs> was written in a very remarkable book by Professor George G.M. James entitled Stolen Legacy. And in this book, Professor James documents what he refers to as the Greek theft and plagiarization of African knowledge. He talks about how uh, the Greeks came to Kemet and it's important to understand, too, that, that most of the names that we use to describe African people, places, and things are European names. The word Egypt is a Greek word. The word pyramid.
pyramid is a Greek word. The word Sphinx is a Greek word. The word Pharaoh is an Asian word. So it's important for us to realize that when we begin the process of recovering our history, we also have to attempt to recover the accurate name so that we can understand what these things really meant. So Professor James documents what he refers to as the Greek theft and plagiarization of African knowledge. He talks about how in 332 BCE, a Macedonian king named Alexander the so-called Great came into Kemet with his army, conquered the land, went up the Nile, and closed practically all of the temples or the educational facilities in Kemet, educational facilities which had literally thousands of books in hundreds of libraries, books on science, books on law, books on medicine, books on philosophy, books on writing, books on architecture, books on mathematics, books on engineering. They confiscated many of these materials and then brought them back to the northernmost part of, of, of Egypt. It was then called Egypt by that time. And after the death of Alexander, one of his generals, Ptolemy, decided to build an educational institution in honor of his fallen general. So they took the city in the northern, they created a city in the northernmost part of Egypt, the city that they called Alexandria, and established an educational institution, the University of Alexandria, and created a library. And it was then where they deposited a copy of every book known to man in this library. It was there that the Greeks then had free access to the accumulated wisdom of the people of ancient Kemet. And again, what Professor James refers to in Stolar Legacy is the actions of Aristotle, who was the former tutor to Alexander, who was given free access to the accumulated wisdom of ancient Kemet. And so, if you understand this very brief historical footnote, you can begin to understand how and why it was possible but for Aristotle to write over 300 books on 40 unrelated topics, which is impossible for one person to do in their lifetime without the aid of a computer, but a very easy thing to do if the information already exists, and all you have to do is translate it from African language into your language, and then you go and pass yourself off to the world as the father of, 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 of philosophy, the father of mathematics, the father of geometry, all of these Greek fathers were really mothers because they went to Africa to study this knowledge and information. And you need to understand that. You also need to understand something about the psychology of a thief who will attempt in every way possible to cover their tracks. So one of the ways that the Greeks covered their tracks was by disfiguring the historical images of the ancient Africans. Go to Kemet today, you'll find that approximately 75 to 80 percent of the statues are missing heads, noses, and lips, which were knocked off in order to disassociate African people from this history and culture. The next slide shows you images that speak for themselves. The statues that you'll see of the ancient Egyptians that have the noses and lips in place are uh, more frequently the, the statues that were built after the Greek and Roman occupation. So the images of the Europeans in Africa, not the original Africans. It's important to realize that. Next slide. But it's also important to understand that not all of the statues were destroyed. In the next slide, you see an image of, next slide please, you see an image of, um, Ramesses II was one of the most prolific builders in ancient Kemet, who was a brother. Again, even though his nose is missing, you can still see that those are big old juicy, kissing <laughs> African lips. You can still see the high cheekbones. You can still identify yourself, can't you? But it's important, again, to understand that even though this statue exists and others like that that portray Ramesses as an African, Europeans in recent years have taken to portraying these historical African personalities as Europeans. Next slide, we'll show you an example. This was an image of the same king that was built during the Greek occupation of Egypt. Check out that nose. 
That's not an African no. <coughs> this was created during the European occupation of Egypt. Next slide shows you uh, another image. This is from National Geographic, 1966. They gave us this image of a Caucasianized Ramesses II. Now think about this. You can go to Africa and see the statues of Ramesses, statues that were built during his lifetime, and you know that this is a brother. And when you see this, you have to stop and say, now wait a minute, this is, this is National Geographic, a respectable institution. Why are they portraying Africans as Europeans? Because they have a profound psychological need right. to see themselves right. in history that is not associated with them. They have, over the past years, rewritten history to their favor. And you've got to understand that dynamic. Next slide shows you Ripley's Believe It or Not cartoon, 1983. Says here the Pharaoh Ramesses II, who ruled Egypt for some 67 years, from about 1292 to 1225 BC, often rode into battle with a trained lion that fiercely attacked his foes. That statement is true. But the portrayal of Ramesses as a Caucasian and his foes as African is a lie. Ramesses was an African. He fought other Africans, but he also fought Asians. There's a very uh, famous battle, the Battle of Kadesh, which was fought in, fought in Asia that is uh, inscribed on several of Ramesses' temples so that you can see the enemies, the, the Asian enemies that he fought. So if you don't know the history, if you don't know that this image is a lie, you all will never be able to exercise the option that Mr. Ripley gives you when he asks you to believe it or not. You won't know what to believe. Next slide. Now, I want to take you all back. Remember that image? of the two beards of Haramakis. I remember the original was on the right and it was broken and had been glued together. And the copy was on the left and you couldn't see any, any, any uh, cracks in it. Seamless copy. All right, take note of this. This is an image, a statue, of a woman that Europeans claim is Nefertiti. Now, let me be honest with you. They don't know who this is. This statue was found on the floor of an abandoned artist studio. It was unfinished, it was unnamed. They didn't know who it was. They just naturally assumed that it must have been Nefertiti. Now, when they found this statue, this statue is now on display in, in Berlin, called the Berlin Bus of Nefertiti. And I was in England last year, walking around in the bookstore and happened to come across this image on the cover of a German book, all right? Now, this is a photograph of the original bust of Nefertiti. It's the original because you can see here the crack where the head was glued back together again. The crown was broken into at least two pieces. This crack descends all the way down around the ear, all the way down around the neck. So it was broken into at least three different pieces. You can see here a gash above her eyebrow. You can also see a hole in her ear where she had an earring. Now this was the original bust of Nefertiti. Next slide will show you the image of Nefertiti that you all accept as the legitimate image. This is the copy of the Berlin bust. Now, it's a copy. There's no crack in the crown. There's no gash above the eye and the eyebrow. There is no hole in the ear. This is a copy. But you, what you should also note is that in this copy, they also lighten her skin and thin her nose to make her more European so that they can say Nefertiti was the most beautiful woman in the world because she was an African. I understand the games that are being played. Next slide, please. Now, this is uh, the temple of the, the Southern Icat of the Temple of Ramesses and Luxor one of dozens of temples that were built in Kemet. Educational facilities, these were the first universities ever built by human beings on this planet. Dozens of them all up and down the Nile River in Kemet. These were the facilities, educational facilities that were ransacked by Alexander during his conquest of Egypt. But it's also important for us to understand that after Egypt was conquered by the Greeks, 
The Romans then conquered uh, Egypt, and then the Muslims conquered Egypt, and then the French came and the British came, and every time someone conquered this land, they took a piece of the soul of Africa. This is, uh, again, the, the front of the Temple of Ramesses, and what I want to focus your attention on is this structure here. This structure is called a teke. It represents the resurrection of Asar. I talked to you all earlier about Asar and how he was uh, murdered and it was later resurrected from the grave. This symbol represents the resurrection of Asar. So wherever you see one Tekken, it represents his resurrection, his overcoming death. Originally, there were two of these structures flanking the entrance of this temple and every temple in Kemet. Wherever you see two Tekken who standing at the entrance to the temples, they represent, in combination, the, the masculine and the feminine, the dual aspects of the creator, the dual aspects of God. But you will notice here, there's only one Tekken. What happened to the other one? Well, Muhammad Ali, who was the ruler of Egypt in 1833, was not an Egyptian, did not revere this history of culture, so he had no ties to it. Muhammad Ali gave this Tekken that was on the right side of the entrance to the temple to his good friend, King Louis Philippe, the King of France gave it to Louis Philippe as a gift in exchange for a clock. The next slide shows you the clock that Muhammad Ali uh, received, which is in his, uh, his mosque in the citadel, citadel. But it's important to know that the clock never worked. <laughs> OK? The clock never worked. But next slide, you see what uh, King Louis Philippe did with his second. It's placed at the Passage de la Concorde in Paris, France. Now again, I want you all to understand the reality that wherever you see this symbol, you're looking at a symbol which represents the resurrection of the African god Asar over death, right? Asar who was born at least 4,000 years, the resurrected savior who was born over 4,000 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. There was in Kemet over 1,200 of these objects. Today, you will find less than a dozen. The rest were scattered all over the world. Every time the Europeans came in, they took, they took, because they needed to have a piece of the heart and soul of Africa in order to get some sense of their own identity. So that if you travel throughout the world now, knowing a little bit about African history, African culture, African science, and African symbolism, you can then begin to reclaim your history. Next slide shows you a Tekken that was stolen from Egypt by the Romans and placed in the center of St. Peter's Square in the Vatican. All right? Every Easter Sunday, the Pope stands on his balcony and delivers his Easter sermon to, to thousands and thousands of people who are gathered in St. Peter's Square around this statue. The Pope delivers his sermon about the resurrection of Jesus the Christ as he stands before a 6,000-year-old monument that represents the resurrection of the African god Asar. He knows that. That's why he prays to Asar's mother, Aset. He knows what the real deal is. Next slide. Here's a Tekken, stolen from Kemet, and is in London. Next slide. Here's a copy of a Tekken that's in um, Charlestown, Massachusetts, Bunker Hill, a monument built by the so-called founding fathers of America, built to memorialize their dead. Understand this now. Founding fathers of America, fighting for their freedom, decide to build a monument in honor of those men who died and decided to make this monument a, a replica of an African symbol which represented the resurrection of an African god. That's important. You need to understand why white folk dig your history and culture more than you do. They need it for their survival. Always have and always will. Next slide. 
All right, you come to my town, Washington, D.C. <laughs> Brother Bruce mentioned that uh, one of the projects that we have going on in Washington is, a, is an Afrocentric tour of Washington. So what I did <coughs> a number of years ago was to, and after traveling to Egypt and then coming back to Washington, I kept, I kept getting flashbacks as I drove around the city. I kept seeing things in Washington that reminded me of things that I had seen in Egypt. So what I decided to do was to identify a number of structures in Washington and then to trace them architecturally and symbolically back to Kemet. And all of these connections are there. All right, and so what you all see here in the Washington Monument, you need to realize that this is a symbol which represents the capital of the most powerful nation on the face of this planet. And it is a symbol which historically and culturally represents the resurrection of an African god. That's powerful information. That's important information. Why don't you all know that? Why haven't you been taught this truth? And if you look at this, the Washington Monument and its reflection in the reflection pool, you'll also find that those responsible for creating this city went back to Kemet again to find other African symbols of inspiration. Here you see the Washington Monument and this reflection in the reflection pool. Let's go to the original. The prototype is this image. This is the temple of Karnak, the Apedai script. You see here two standing Tekanu. Right here, here you see their reflection in the sacred lake. Every temple in Kemet had Tekanu and had a sacred lake. So the idea of a reflection pool in Washington, D.C. ain't original. You need to know where they got the idea from and why they selected it. It's important. It's your stuff. Next slide. This is a copy. <laughs> this is a copy of a design that was submitted by John Russell Pope who was an architect in Washington responsible for creating many of the monuments in Washington, D.C. There was a committee that was established in, in 19, uh, 1911. A committee was established to design a memorial for Abraham Lincoln. So John Russell Pope submitted this, a scale model of Khufu's pyramid as a fitting memorial for Abraham Lincoln. Now the members of the committee said, now wait a minute, John, you're going a little bit too far. And so they rejected his design for a more traditional Greco-Roman style, as we see in the next slide, this is the image that they decided to use, a right, more traditional Greco-Roman style uh, temple. But in the center of the temple is a statue of Abraham Lincoln, right? Next slide shows you the statue of Abraham Lincoln in the, in the memorial. But what you need to be aware of is that the artist, the sculptor who created this statue, was inspired by a statue that he had seen in Egypt. So here's Lincoln sitting in his memorial. The next slide shows you Ramesses seated in his memorial. <laughs> All right? The information is there. You just have to seek it out right before your very eyes. Next slide. Here's a pyramid, scale model of Khufu's pyramid in Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, Tennessee has a sister city relationship with Memphis in Egypt, all right? Memphis in Egypt was the capital of the country before it was later moved to Waset. So Memphis was where the, the president of Kemet lived in a palace that was called the Double White House. Can you get to that? The Double White House. Andrew Jackson, one of the founders of Memphis, Tennessee, named the city Memphis, Tennessee, after Memphis in Egypt, because the city was located right along the Mississippi River, which reminded him of the Nile River. So again, you see the attempt by Europeans, whenever possible, to try to reproduce Africa wherever they find themselves. They can't get enough of it. Next slide. Here in San Francisco, you see another pyramid. Everywhere you go, all over the world, if you know what to look for, if you know, if you know the history of architecture, the symbolism associated with architecture, you can trace many structures here in this country all the way back to an African-inspired source. As a matter of fact, the second, uh, the second uh, book in this series of, of uh, Exploding the Myths is going to deal with an African-centered view of Washington, D.C. 
masonry in the United States, in which we're going to talk about this whole relationship between architecture, uh, masonry, and ancient Egypt, because all of these connections are there. Next slide. Uh, here's a page out of the book that shows you uh, the, the African origins of so-called Greco-Roman architecture, all of the, the Ionic, the Doric, the Corinthian, the Etruscan, and the composite columns developed by the Greeks and the Romans were nothing but variations of a theme that were developed in Kemet thousands of years earlier. Next slide. Here's a photograph of Imhotep, who is recorded in history as the world's first multi-genius, the first architect in the history of humanity, the first physician in the history of humanity, a philosopher, poet, prime minister to the king, Zosa, a person who was so revered by his fellow countrymen that after he died, he was elevated to the position of a deity, and he was later given the title of Christ. Understand that the word Christ is a title, which means the anointed one. And Imhotep is recorded in European history. You ain't got to take my word for it. Go look at European history books. And they refer to Imhotep as the world's first Christ. Right. Next slide. These are symbols of medicine, symbols developed by Imhotep that represented the art of medicine, the caduceus here was later associated with uh, Jehudi, who was the African god that was associated with medicine. These same symbols were modified by Europeans and are now used as a symbol for the National Medical Association, the American Medical Association. This is the caduceus. This is a symbol of medicine. All doctors have this symbol. Utilize this symbol. It can be traced all the way back to the first physicians in Africa. The Rx symbol for pharmacy, is a modified version of the Eye of Jehudi. Jehudi was the African god associated with medicine. All right? Developed, this symbol was developed by the Roman physician Galen in the second century, who used to write prescriptions for his patients in Medunessa, the writing form that we all call hieroglyphics. Next slide. Here's a, a picture out of the book that shows you the traces, the origins of Greek and the Roman god. Homer, the first Greek author of any significance, stated that all of the gods of Greece came from Africa and had to return to Ethiopia once a year or else they would become mortal. All of the gods of Greece can be traced back to African personalities. After Greece was conquered by the Romans, the Romans then took on the, uh, the character of all of the uh, Greek gods, Latinized them, and made them Roman. And at the top I have an example of just one, one personality. This is the, the uh, Kemetic god of medicine, Jehudi, the wife of Ma'at, who recorded in the Book of Judgment the, the, the weighing of the soul. He's also known as the god of medicine, holding in his hands a twin staff with serpents, staffs representing uh, the kingdom of Upper and Lower Kemet. Later we see here the Greek interpretation of Jehudi as Hermes, carrying the caduceus or the staff of Hermes. And then we see the Roman version of the same man as Mercury, holding in his hand the same symbol, which can be traced all the way back to Kemet if you know what to look for. Next slide. Even the alphabet, letters that you all use today, the alphabet in the English language, were derived from the Roman characters, which were derived from the Greek characters, which were derived from Phoenician characters, which were derived from Kemetic characters, which can be traced all the way back to Kemetic characters. In every instance, every letter means the same thing in the Kemetic language as it does in the Semitic and the Phoenician and eventually the Roman alphabet. The first writer. All the evidence is there. Next slide. Yeah, yeah, again, going back to my artistic bag, because I like to deal with these symbols, all right? Here's a symbol for the eye of Heru. Who is Heru? Son of God. The son of God, all right? His image is on the face of the statue of Hermaki, the statue that we call the Sphinx. The right eye of Heru 
is the symbol which represents God. Another symbol for Heru is the falcon, all right? And the right eye uh, of the falcon, again, symbolizes God. It's also a symbol associated with the sun, okay? And it represents the omnipresent power of God, like the, the, the sun represents the omnipresent power of God, the creator, to see everything, everywhere, at all times. This same symbol was developed as the logo for CBS by a brother who later quit CBS because they refused to pay him for his design. This symbol represents the omnipresent eye of the camera, which can see images, record them, and transmit those images anywhere in the world. This concept was so significant that HBO used a modified version of it for its logo. Hollywood Pictures uses an image of the sun setting behind Hair Maki for their logo. All right? Other logos in, in the United States and in Europe have borrowed on themes that were developed by Africans thousands of years ago. Again, reinforcing the reality that Europeans can't get enough of your stuff. <laughs> Next slide. Now, check this out. I was, in, uh, I was in Houston last year giving a lecture, and the brother came up to me after the lecture, and he was an artist too. He said, man, have you, have you ever noticed that, that the Oscar is, is, is the same as the symbol for Batal? Check it out. And I was like, yeah, brother, okay, okay, you know. But I looked, I went back and looked at my book. I did a little research on the Oscar. It's important for you all to understand that the Oscar is the highest award that is given by the Motion Picture Academy for Arts and Sciences. Sciences, right? Motion Picture Academy for Arts and Sciences. It is patterned after this image of Ptah, who is a patron god of Memphis. Ptah was a god of artists and craftsmen. All right? <laughs> That's why, what was it, 131 years ago, 131 years ago, when your ancestors were enslaved, that's why Europeans made it uh, illegal for you all to read or write. See, because this information is not hidden. It's readily available in books all over the world. And if you like to read, if you're turned on by information, you can go to these libraries and uncover this information, which has always been there. But as a result of our miseducation, Europeans can feel very comfortable with the statement that if you want to keep a secret from black folk, put it in the book. <laughs> but I'm so glad to say, judging from you all here tonight, that that's a lie. Amen. You all are reading. <laughs> through your reading, through your studying, you will be able to do what the Europeans never wanted you all to do, to begin to think for yourselves as free men and women. That's what this whole mission is all about. Next slide. Um, again, it's important to understand, <coughs> after this country was founded, 1776, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, established a committee to design a symbol which was to represent the heart and soul of the United States of America. This committee was in existence for six years, from 1776 to 1802. Three different committees were formed to design what we now refer to as the Great Seal of the United States of America. Now, again, you all need to be aware, be made aware of the obvious. Why is it that whenever Europeans want to design something of, of importance for them, why is it they always go back to Africa? If you look at this symbol, on the reverse of the Great Seal, this is on all of, your, all of your dollar bills. This symbol, the reverse of the Great Bill, uh, uh, on the reverse of the Great Seal is this symbol here. What is this? I have 
Peru. What is this? At, at, at some point in time, when you get out of, you know, when you get out of this Negro mentality, at some point in time, you're going to look at this and start asking questions. What a pyramid doing on the back of the dollar bill? <laughs> and then stop. Well, wait a minute now. Let me think. Of this supposedly represents European American culture. So stop and think about it now. Where are the pyramids in France? Pyramids in England. Pyramids in Germany. Pyramids in Switzerland. Pyramids in Nova Scotia. The only place you will find pyramids is where African people have lived. Approximately 92 pyramids in Egypt, 15 pyramids in, in the Sudan, and about a dozen pyramids in Ethiopia. The only other place outside of the continent of Africa where you will find pyramids is in Mexico. And again, you all had the, had the privilege of listening to uh, Dr. Ivan Van Turnham, who talks about the reality that Africans from the Nile Valley navigated the Atlantic Ocean somewhere between 900 and 600 BCE and brought with them knowledge of pyramid building, stone construction, concepts of God, and higher mathematics. So wherever African people have gone throughout the world, they have established culture. This is their hallmark. <laughs> the front of the Great Seal shows you this symbol, an eagle. It's important to note that this symbol of the eagle was patterned after this symbol of Heru. This symbol was created over 5,000 years before this symbol. It's also important for you all to understand that every element of these symbols is symbolic. Realize this, that these men didn't just arbitrarily sit down at a table and, and draw a circle and put a pyramid in the circle and put an eye above the pyramid. They debated and argued about everything that you see before you on the screen. It's no coincidence that this pyramid has 13 rows of stone. It's no coincidence that the eagle has in its chest a shield with 13 stripes has in this car an olive branch with 13 leaves on it and 13 berries, have in this car 13 arrows, have in this mouth a banner with the words E Pluribus Unum, which is comprised of 13 letters. There's no coincidence that the eagle has above its head a cluster of 13 stars in the shape of the so-called Star of David, a symbol that was created and used in Africa and India before the Jews. So what does this mean? I mean, what's the significance? At some point in time, again, Negroes are going to wake up and ask questions. What does all of this mean? Why have you been led, if you've been led to believe that 13 is an unlucky number, why is the number 13 repeated 13 times on the dollar bill? Hmm? So obviously, there has to be another meaning. You all have got to, you know, begin to process this information and begin to understand the reality that information is presented on several different levels. Those who wish to control people have utilized the information on the highest level. Those who are controlled utilize the information that is presented on the lowest level. So on the lowest level, you all believe that 13 is an unlucky number. Friday the 13th is an unlucky day. Go to a, go to a, a, a theater, you won't find a 13th row. Go into a building, you won't find a 13th floor. floor. So what is the significance of 13? Again, if you study something about the people who are responsible for establishing this country, you'll find that they existed within, they had an organization that had an understanding of the symbolic significance of numbers. Every number represents profound concepts and ideas that most people aren't aware of. Number one represents God, the creator. The number two represents man and woman who come from God. Number three represents the child, which comes from the union of man and woman. Every number means something significant. The number 12 represents the completion of a cycle. That's why you have 12, uh, 12 uh, hours during the day, 12 hours of night during the time of the equinox, which represents a complete day. That's why you have 12 months in a year, which represents a complete year. So what is the significance of the number 13? The number 13 represents the process of spiritual transformation. That is, the energy from the completed cycle of 12 then begins to move into a higher state. It is referred to as the process of spiritual transformation. Again, look at European history and you'll find examples of that. Jesus the Christ and how many disciples? Twelve plus Jesus? Thirteen. King Arthur had how many knights in the round table? 
12 plus King Arthur. Um, every Christmas, you all sing a carol about how many days of Christmas. 12 days of Christmas. 13th day of Christmas is January the 6th, which is the day of the Epiphany. And in the Catholic tradition, any Catholic come here, you all would know that the day of the Epiphany is celebrated as the day of the spiritual transformation of Jesus the Christ. You all go to court, you're going to be tried by how many people in the jury? Twelve folk in the jury and a judge. All right. So there is nothing unlucky about the number 13. It is unlucky for you all not to know what it represents. That there is another level of knowledge that has intentionally been kept away from you. And as long as you are left in the dark, you will continue to pray to God that don't look like you and you will never have your prayers answered. Take you back to Hair Market, okay? Take you back to Hair Market. I want you all to focus. Again, I'm going to play the role of a psychiatrist again. And you all are in therapy, right? I want you all to focus your attention on this stone tablet. This Stella. Next slide shows you a close up of that. I want you all to look at this image and tell me what thoughts it brings to mind. Ten Commandments, right? That's a good start. Now, Ten Commandments. When you think of Ten Commandments, you think of who? Moses. Moses. Moses, right? When you think of Moses, you got to realize the reality that where did Moses go to school? It says in the Bible, Moses was learned in all of the wisdom of the Egyptians, which meant he went to school in Kemet, which meant that he learned everything that all of the priests learned in Kemet. All right? So that means that Moses was acquainted with the 42 declarations of innocence. So when Moses led these group of people out of Egypt and gave them 10 commandments, what they don't tell you is that he left 32 behind. Okay? They don't tell you that. But this structure here, this stellar, was used in Kemet to record significant events in the life of a person. And I ask you, what could be more important, what could be more significant in your life than the day you were born and the day that you died? Next slide. Huh? Hello. Now, look at this. Here again, we see African symbols standing over the grave of Europeans. What does that mean? It means, sisters and brothers, that Europeans have a profound psychological need to surround themselves with African symbols and activities pertaining to life and death. When they die, they want to be close to those things that were created by African ancestors because they know what they really, or they have an idea. They don't know. They have an idea as to the power that is obtained, can be obtained from these symbols. So much so that, next slide, next time you're around a cemetery, Indeed. go to lay some flowers on the grave, you're gonna see this symbol. This represents the resurrection of who? Asar. Why don't you all know, why were you never taught this in school or in church? Next slide. Now, as we attempt to <laughs> present this information to you, there are those who will say we're fabricating history. There are those who will say that this Afrocentric education is nothing but a myth, that the Greeks did not steal from the Egyptians, they did not borrow from the Egyptians. Uh, uh, you believe that as long as you read their books. But if you go and access the other information which is available to you, you will begin to understand why they cannot afford now to tell you the truth. Right? Next slide. And they will continue to play games with you. And again, if you don't know the history, you will fall prey. You'll be a sucker for these images. I mean, imagine the nerve of Newsweek to put this caption on this cover. Was Cleopatra black? and then put an African earring, a red, black, and green earring in their ear. 
<laughs> Imagine the nerve of them. Was Cleopatra black? I don't care if Cleopatra was black. Cleopatra is insignificant. Cleopatra lived 300 years after Egypt had been conquered by the Greeks. So it meant that, if anything, she was of mixed parentage. So if they want Cleopatra, they can have her. <laughs> She's insignificant. Let's go, let's go a thousand years before Cleopatra, 2,000 years before Cleopatra, and ask if those African personalities were black. They won't do that. So when, when this issue was raised, next slide. When this issue was raised, Dr. Hilliard, Asa Hilliard, in an article that appeared in uh, the New York Times, uh, raised this issue as they were attacking our African Center scholars. Dr. Hilliard suggested that, that they <coughs> show an image of an African queen and suggested that they get an image of Queen T to run with their story on uh, African-centered education. Now, let me read to you. They ran, there are like dozens of images of Queen T that they could have used to illustrate their story, but they intentionally selected this story. And let me read to you the caption that they ran underneath this, this photograph. This comes from the February 4th, 1990 issue of the New York Times from an article entitled, Africans, Africa's Claim to Egypt's History Grows More Insistent. All right? The caption underneath this photograph read, sculpture believed to be the head of Queen T of Egypt, who lived in the 14th century BC. Revisionist historians argue that she was a black descendant. She was a black descendant. Now see, they intentionally selected an article, a, a, an image that showed half of her face. But even, I mean, look at these lips. How many white folks you know have lips like that? But let's put this issue aside and let's go in our gallery and get another issue, another image of Queen T. The image that they didn't want to show you was this image. Now, can you imagine them saying that black Africans want to claim that she was African? Can you imagine showing you this image? If you see this image of Queen T, you also need to be aware of her husband. Next slide shows you her husband. Amenhotep III. You see this African couple. Again, forget Cleopatra. Let's look at this Af one African family. Queen T, her husband, Amenhotep III. Let's look at their son. Amenhotep IV, Akhenaten. I, I like to call this brother Lionel Richie. <laughs> Let's look at his little brother. Who is his little brother? King Tut. This is an African family. Now, I, 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 would, I would dare say that all of you all have seen this image dozens of times. How many of you all have ever seen the back of this image? Okay, only a handful. You've never seen the back of this image because if you did, you would realize that this question as to the ethnicity of the Egyptians was totally irrelevant. Next slide shows you the back of the mask of King Tut. Venus and Cornrows, I mean, who wears their hair like that? Charlton Heston? <laughs> Next slide shows you images of African king, other African kings, cornrows. Yeah. Yeah. Photograph from the um, Cairo Museum again, the wigs that were worn by an uh, African priest. Hairstyle is identical to uh, cornrows worn by sisters today. Cultural continuity here, sisters and brothers. Next slide. A comb used by them. <laughs> now imagine people telling you that these people with hair like this, with faces like that, weren't African. They even went so far as to refer to them as dark-skinned white people. <laughs> <laughs> Check out the 1977 edition of World Book Encyclopedia. They describe the Egyptians as dark-skinned white. Next slide. Now. <laughs> Let's wind this whole thing up, and let's talk about the, the relevancy of knowing your history, your culture. More specifically, let's talk about what happens to you when you deny your history, your culture, when you reject your Africanness, when you bought into the lie that 
Straight hair is good hair. When you buy into the lie that the light skin is fair skin. When you buy, buy into the lie that a good nose is a pointed nose. Good lips are thin lips. When you buy into the lie, then you will reject the image of the man or the woman who stares back at you in the mirror. You will reject the image of God. And if you have enough money, you then will pay a plastic surgeon to do to you what Napoleon did to Haramaki. That is to change your nose and your lips. Now this is a psychological disorder that I refer to as the Michael Jackson syndrome. <laughs> but years before Michael Jackson was caught up into this, other entertainers who made it, had money, had fame, had fortune, but did not have a sense of their cultural identity, other entertainers bought into this life. Show you here Patti LaBelle before her change. Next slide is Patty after her transformation. I want you to, to be aware of the pattern that you're seeing before you. In every instance, you're seeing Africans who have accepted the lie that they are Negroes and have changed their noses, their lips, and their hair in an attempt to be more European. Next slide shows you George Bishop, isn't George Bishop from Pittsburgh? Yeah. <laughs> this is George before, this is George after. <laughs> Next slide. This is Stephanie Mills before she saw the wind. <laughs> this is Stephanie after. Next slide shows you. Michael Jackson, when he was a normal human being. This slide shows you Michael after he's had plastic surgery on his chin three times, went back and added the plastic, plastic surgery on his nose four times, had his um, cheekbones surgically heightened, his eyes surgically widened, permanent mascara tattooed around his eyes, chemical treatments on his hair put so many chemicals on his hair that when he was filming the Pepsi commercial in 85, got a little bit too close to the light and his hair caught on fire because of all that jerry curl juice. <laughs> Next slide. Now, this issue so significant that an organization entitled the Black Owned Communications Alliance talked about the power of images in the media to influence the thinking patterns of our children. And they asked a very important question, what is wrong with these children? What will happen to the minds of your children who grow up every day seeing Europeans portrayed as heroes and sheroes, and then seeing Africans portrayed as, as dope addicts and, and drug dealers and thieves and criminals, welfare mothers. When they see these patterns repeated over and over again, they say, I don't want to be like them. And then we wonder what's wrong with our children. I mean, this is an issue that I had to come face to face with raising my daughter. When my daughter came home from me from school one day and said that she wanted to go to a Halloween party at school dressed as Snow White. And so I had to stop and process that, process her request. You know, why would she want to go as Snow White? And I remembered that the movie Snow White had just been recently re-released. Re and so there were commercials on television. There were advertisements in the newspaper. There were images on the back of the cereal boxes. So it was my responsibility to tell my daughter, Snow White is not an acceptable image. If I'm going to allow you to participate in a pagan holiday, that's right, that's right. then I at least will allow you to wear a costume that will reflect some sense of your cultural identity. So in walking through the store, I could find no image that would reinforce a sense of self. I saw images of a Batman, a Superman, Kermit the Frog, Miss Piggy, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle figments of other people's imagination. So I decided that, that I, I will reject all of those images and create a costume for my daughter. Uh, next slide shows you uh, the costume that I made for her, which all I, all I did was to think back of some, think of some images that I had seen in Egypt. There was an image of an African goddess by the name of Nut that I thought was 
culturally significant. And so I patterned this costume after Newt. The next slide shows you this image of Newt on the ceiling of a tomb in the West Bank of Kemet. And what it shows you is the reverence that Africans had for, this, for their women, for their women. Newt is the goddess of the sky. Here you see her hands and her feet touching the earth, and her body is stretched across the sky. You see her head about to swallow the red disk of the sun as it sets in the western horizon. The sun now is swallowed by the nighttime sky, and you see here the sun moving through her stomach, through the nighttime sky, and you see the stars in her body. If you go over to this other, on the other side of the screen, you see the sun now emerging in the eastern horizon as a golden ball of light. You see the sun now emerging from the womb of this African goddess. And you realize how powerful this symbol is. The sun was a symbol that was historically associated with God. And here you see an African woman giving birth to God. Powerful concept. particularly our sisters need to be aware of because they need to understand who they are. And so what I did was to, you know, working with my daughter, try to introduce her to those concepts. The next slide shows you uh, another Halloween costume that we made every year now. She's a little bit too old for Halloween costume now, but every year we would have her dressed up as an African personality. This year, uh, she went as Queen Nefertari, the wife of Ramesses II, won first prize in a Halloween uh, contest at school. And so what's, what's been so interesting and so positive is to see now that over the last few years, other parents in the school have begun to dress their children up in African costumes. So that you see now on Halloween, the brothers coming in as M Hotel, you know? <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. Why would you dress your child up like Freddy Krueger and then wonder why he acts like a monster? Why would you dress your child up like a witch or a devil and then wonder why they behave like animals? You all have the keys to change the behavior. Next slide, please. So, winding down, um, I want to reinforce within your minds again the importance of holding your history and your culture sacred. The importance of understanding that you have an obligation to learn the truth about your history and your culture and to pass that information on to your children. Can we have the light, please? I realized how important this issue was. this issue was when I took my daughter to Egypt in 1989. I took her on one of my study tours because I wanted her to have an opportunity to see why her daddy was spending so much time traveling to Africa and going to lectures and why I was taking her to lectures. I wanted her to understand something about her history and her culture. And so later after that trip, an idea was suggested by a friend of ours that my daughter write a book about her experiences. So what we did, <laughs> was to uh, get together in the evening, and we made a homework assignment of this book. So over a period of about uh, seven weeks, we worked on writing a book. And so the end product is a daughter's book, My First Trip to Africa, All right? And so as a result of this book, my daughter, who is now 11, travels all over the country, lectures to schools and churches and organizations about her travels to Egypt, her experiences as a young writer, talks about um, what she's doing with the money. My daughter and I have a working relationship now. The relationship is that wherever, whenever I travel to another part of the world and she accompanies me, she's going to write a book or we're going to write a book about her travels. And the money from the sale of her book is going into a trust fund to pay for her college tuition. So I am teaching my daughter, number one, that she is going to college. Number two, she's going to help pay for her college tuition, <laughs> all right? So the reality is that each one of us 
have an obligation to raise ourselves up so that we can raise up our children. We have an obligation to reach out to those within our extended family that have been brainwashed to reject this type of information and find ways to let them know that it's all right to be happy. Right. Because there is, something, right. there, there is something to be proud of. Right. Other people have taken pride in African history. And as an African, you have a right to be proud of yourself as well. We have to resurrect ourselves. I want to close by um, reciting the poem from the Browder File, poem entitled Transition 13. And now that you all are familiar with the uh, spiritual significance of the number 13, maybe you can, you can appreciate the spirit in which this poem was written. It says, in the beginning, we knew not. And we studied. And we learned all there was to know, and we taught others. Then we forgot what we had learned, and then forgot that we had forgotten. Now we are taught by those who were once taught by us knowledge that we already have. So we study, we form study groups to study and to learn all there is to know and to teach others. The question is, that the challenge that we're confronted with is, will we forget again? Thank you. African history class, I'd like to make a presentation to Brother Browder. I don't know if most of you got a list of the itinerary for the year and you saw Mr. Browder, Brother Browder's name on there. What you don't know is at the last minute, uh, the, the organization that was going to pay for him to come backed out on us just like two days ago. So we had to scramble around and uh, get together uh, some funds, and that's another reason why we had to charge two dollars at the door to cover this situation. Um, and as Mr. Brown, I just want to let Brother Browder know we don't have much, but uh, I want to share with them from from the class. I want to give him a T-shirt from us that has the Nguza Saba on the back, and it has a picture of the motherland the way it should be. Right. Let me just say, um, in closing, that you are...